Hello, I'm Jorge Getoso. Welcome to a new program. On today's show, we're going to be discussing the first year of Donald Trump at the Oval Office with Brian Becker, National Coordinator of the Answer Coalition. Brian Becker, a well, welcome to the program. Thank you. My pleasure. Brian, we have seen in the last few days um, the retweeting of three anti-Islamic uh, tweets from Donald Trump. What is his political calculation, if any? Is he trying to appeal to his base? What is he, that exacerbation of bigotry and, uh, if you want, uh, uh, xenophobia? Well, your question assumes that there is a calculation as opposed to a spontaneous action by Donald Trump, which is just as possible. Uh, Donald Trump uh, retweets, as the President of the United States, early in the morning, these fascist anti-Muslim videos, some of which have been produced probably by ISIS, uh, some of which are fake news completely. Why did he do it? Was it to appeal to his base? Well, one part of his base would, would of course, embrace it, because there is a white supremacist, xenophobic, anti-Muslim group. So much so that uh, David Duke was saying, thank God for Trump, that's why we love him, talking about the ex-leader of the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah, of course. The, 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 uh, David Duke, the KKK, the Nazis, uh, they love this kind of thing. There's a ni another part of his base which will be embarrassed by it, which will think, well, we didn't actually vote for Donald Trump in order to uh, send out, retweet white supremacist, anti-Islamic videos. So I don't really believe there's a calculation. I think Donald Trump was going through his Twitter feed and saw a video that he liked because it was so pronounced against Muslims, and he thought, that's great, let me send this out. I think it's that shallow, that superficial of thinking on the, on the part of Donald Trump, not really a calculation. 2016, record inequality according to the Federal Reserve of the U.S. economy. We're talking about 1% was owning something like 40% of the, of the wealth. What's the trend during the first year of Trump? Well, inco income inequality is, uh, of course, growing. It's growing for different reasons. Some are systemic to neoliberal capitalism, this stage of modern monopoly capitalism, uh, whereby wages are being driven down because uh, industrial uh, uh, producers can go overseas and find lower wage jobs. So higher wage countries like the United States are competing with lower wage countries. Uh, also because of Donald Trump's uh, policies, though. In other words, he's trying to do away with uh, any of the advantages or social programs that might have been beneficial to working class and to poor people. It's fundamentally a war going on in America by the U.S. government against poor people, and as a consequence, income inequality will undoubtedly grow. Bernie Sanders, talking about the tax reform that has been discussed, say in highlights, they say 80% of all the reduction of uh, taxes is going to go to the 1%. 40% of that reduction to the one-tenth of 1%, one-third of the middle class is going to pay more taxes. How fair and how uh, beneficial for the middle class, as uh, President Trump is trying to sell it, is it going to end up being? There's no such thing as fairness for the working class with Donald Trump's economic policies. This is a major redistribution of wealth from the bottom, from the working class, from the poor, from the middle class straight to the top 1%. And again, we see that the top 1% already owns almost everything. It's not just the 1%, there's also the 20%, uh, the people who are making $250,000 annually or more. Uh, those people have everything they could possibly need in the United States. It's not a small number of people. It's probably 60 million people. That's what 20% is. But it's the top 1%, maybe the top 20% uh, that get all the benefits. You'll see the people who make less than $30,000, which is really poverty, their taxes will go up within a few years if this tax plan goes up, uh, goes, uh, is passed. Uh, graduate students, this is a disaster. Right now, d graduate students have a, a tuition waiver. Let's say you're making $34,000 as a stipend for an advanced degree in science or, or, or one of the other uh, advanced programs. Uh, right now, you get also um, a $34,000 stipend, $65,000 in tuition waiver. That $65,000, which you never get, will now be considered income and be taxed. So you'll be taxed at the level of a $90,000. So graduate students are going to start dropping out in the United States. How would that make sense from, an e from the point of view not just of economic policy, but education policy 
or what's good for U.S. industry. This commitment to the ultra-rich is actually driving the country or most of the country into the ditch. The other side of the coin, what the President Trump is saying is the economy is doing extremely well. Third quarter increase growth, 3.3 percent. The Dow Jones grew 6,000 points since uh, Trump was elected. Uh, the economy is doing great. Uh, unemployment, one of the lowest in, in history since uh, 2004. What to blame? Well, the unemployment number is essentially not true. Uh, you have to look not just at how many people are officially determined to be unemployed, because that doesn't include people who have given up working because they can't find a job or a job at a decent wage. The number of people who are actually in the workforce compared to those who are outside the workforce is still a lower number than it was in 2008. Uh, that's the real number. Why is the stock market going through the roof? Why is it going to outside the galaxy? Why is it at 24,000 points? Because the Federal Reserve has had a policy called quantitative easing, which has basically given about $5 trillion to the biggest banks with no questions asked, no strings attached, and that money is being used as an investment in a casino, and the casino is called the New York Stock Exchange. And so they have free money, and they can drive up stock prices, but this is ultimately a bubble. It doesn't reflect the actual status of the American economy, and like all bubbles, they burst. We're talking about record inequality in terms of uh, distribution of wealth. What, therefore, is the state of democracy in the U.S. at this point? Uh, here's the real status of a democracy. All the people who are so poor that they can't send their kids to a doctor, all the people who are almost losing their apartments, all the people who have already lost their apartments, they get to vote every two or four years for a group of billionaire or millionaire politicians, but they don't have the right to a decent wage, they don't have the right to a decent home, they don't have the right to go to a doctor or send their kids to a doctor when they're sick. They get to a, a right to vote for who will oppress them for the next four years. Is the um, Stockholm Syndrome? Well, I mean, maybe it is the Stockholm Syndrome where the hostage becomes in love with the hostage taker. But, but maybe not. Maybe what we're seeing and what we saw with the Bernie Sanders campaign is people are just frustrated but lacking leadership, lacking a movement that they can be a part of. As soon as they see a movement like the Sanders campaign appeared to be a movement for social change and for equality, they join it. So even though Bernie Sanders appeared to have no chance to win the uh, nomination, much less the presidency, tens of millions of people, tens of millions of people who have never been involved in politics got involved because they want change, they need change. Those were young people. On the other hand, what did happen with the National Democratic Committee? According to talking about emails that has been revealed through WikiLeaks, it was a clear sabotage from the Clinton campaign and precisely John Podesta in order to uh, sabotage the campaign of uh, Bernie Sanders and make sure that Bernie Sanders, quote unquote, a socialist, quote unquote, a communist, according to Trump will reach <laughs> the nomination and eventually could dispute the president of the United States. Right. The, the, uh, the Democratic primary process was completely rigged. Not only do we know this from the emails, there have been subsequent revelations whereby we have learned that the Democratic National Committee was bankrupt in 2015, bankrupt, and the Hillary Clinton campaign secretly arranged for uh, a, a, a system whereby the Clinton campaign would bail out finance the Democratic National Take Committee. Take over the control. Yes, and, if, and of course, if you're paying the bills, if you're the financier you're of the, the Democratic boss. National Committee, you're the boss. And so we knew before the election started. See, that was the problem Hillary Clinton had. She thought, the election belongs to me. The nomination belongs to me. I don't need to, shouldn't have any competitors. It was like a coronation of a monarch rather than somebody who actually had to prove themselves. And so the campaign was so ridiculous. She never went to Wisconsin. She went to Michigan once. She, did, she ignored Pennsylvania. All of these battleground states, she just assumed those states belong to me. The nomination belongs to me. The election belongs to me. Guess what? It doesn't. You actually have to compete. So talking about the midterms election, we're talking about a few weeks away from 2018. Uh, what is your forecast? Um, I don't have a crystal ball. I gave that up November 8th when I predicted that Donald Trump could never win the presidency of the United States. Uh, so wrong. So I don't have a prediction, but it's a rough road for the Democrats to uh, win control of the House of Representatives. 
Uh, they would need to pick up 24 seats. I don't think they can do that because gerrymandering is such in the United States, whereby congressional districts have been carved out by largely Republican governorships so that it's almost impossible to win. In 2016, five million more people voted for Democrats in the House of Representative races than Republicans, and yet the Republicans have this huge advantage in the, Republic, in the House of Representatives because of gerrymandering. In other words, American democracy is so rigged in so many different ways uh, that it's almost impossible, one, for working class people to participate, and even for the Democrats when they win in aggregate numbers, they still lose, including the presidency. What about the Senate? The Senate is closer, of course. Um, it's possible that the balance will tip maybe by one vote. I don't think so. I think it'll still be in the hands of the Republicans. But even if it does, so what? Some of the Democrats who are competing with Republican uh, um, sort of vulnerable candidates, they're running like Republicans. In other words, in order to win against a Republican in a Republican stronghold, you sound like a Republican. If you pretend to be a conservative, are you a conservative? Well, of course you're a conservative. So I don't think even if the balance shifts in the Senate or the House, much will change. Let's not forget, in 2009, the Democrats had a popular president in the White House, the big majority in the House of Representatives, big majority in the Senate, 59 votes. They could do whatever they did, wanted to do, and they did, which was nothing. The only thing they passed was the Affordable Care Act, which was to privatize American health care, uh, give it all over to private insurance companies, to which the Republicans said, even though it was a Republican program, that's communism. I mean, that's the only thing that the Democrats did. What about uh, Donald Trump? Is he finishing his term? Is he going, is he going to be impeached? Uh, hard to say. The Mueller investigation, you can see they're getting lots of what will be indictments of people around Donald Trump. Not because of collusion, by the way. It's about everything else. It's called charge stacking. You give somebody 10 charges. Uh, they were looking at 50 years in prison. Then just get them to say something against somebody else. Uh, that's what's going on. It's not about, there's no proof of collusion, but there's going to be a lot of indictments. Could some of them touch Donald Trump and bring him down? Yes, possibly. The problem for the Republicans is Donald Trump is very popular among Republicans. And so if they impeach him, if they throw him out, do they not alienate their Republican base? Does that not sabotage their efforts in 2020? That's Donald Trump's big card right now. On the other hand, Donald Trump, oh, today I will say that he's, he's owning the Republican Party. He is the Republican Party. That's just a big change. It's a big change. Well, you know, whoever is the president is in charge of the party. It's not like a really democratic process where the Central Committee or the National Committee determines policy. Whoever is the candidate or whoever is the, uh, the president, they run the party. And Donald Trump has support among the Republican base because he doesn't seem like a politician. He's defiant against the establishment. He's racist, so a lot of people like that. Uh, he looks like a reality TV show person. Oh, and he is. And you know, people in America have learned to love reality TV, and now they have one uh, reality TV performer as president. So they're some part of the American population. So, oh yeah, I recognize that. That's fun. I'm going to invite you, Brian, to make a little break, and we keep talking. Sure. We're talking with Brian Becker. Brian Becker is a national coordinator of the Answer Coalition. We'll be right back. A sign of resistance to hatred and injustice. Bill Fletcher, Jr. conducts a discussion and analysis space to reveal the social struggles of black people on the Global Africa. Wednesdays, only on Telesur. We continue to talk about uh, Donald Trump's presidency with Brian Becker. He is a national coordinator of the Answer Coalition. Brian, uh, we're talking about immigration. Uh, um, most definitely, there is that bias of Donald Trump against immigrants, against uh, refugees. What to expect? There is a reign of terror going on against working class immigrant families in the United States. 
The number of people who have been arrested by ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, is, has increased 40 percent, 40 percent in the last year. And we remember Obama deported more people than any president previously in American history. Now it's up 40 percent. You go to some areas like Georgia, like Atlanta, it's increased 80 percent. This is the work of Jeff Sessions. He's the uh, attorney general. He is the, was the chief xenophobe and anti-immigrant person within the U.S. Senate. Trump named him as attorney general. Now, you see the Democrats? They're attacking Jeff Sessions because what Russian did you meet with? Didn't you meet with a Russian ambassador? Didn't you meet a Russian at a cocktail party? Meanwhile, there's a reign of terror against Latinos and against immigrant families in America, and it's being conducted by Jeff Sessions. There's no big controversy by the Democrats in the Senate. So what's happening? The immigrant rights groups, which are very powerful in the United States, have been set back. They've been set back because the reign of terror is so great, people actually don't want to go out of their houses. If they get stopped at a stop sign, or if they're out at a playground and ICE agents come, uh, parents are ripped away from their children. Uh, they could be deported. They could be imprisoned for a long time. I mean, it is a terrible, racist, anti-immigrant wave of terror that's going on in America. You were mentioning Latinos, and most of precisely the people who are being deported or arrested are from Latin America. What about uh, Donald Trump's foreign policy regarding Latin America? Well, Donald Trump's foreign policy is, like everywhere, uh, a lot of bluster, a lot of bluff, but very right wing. He keeps threatening Venezuela. If Venezuela has an election for a constituent assembly and the vote doesn't go the way the U.S. wants it, Donald Trump says all options are on the table, as if the United States is going to invade or bomb Venezuela. Uh, he's, he's, declare, he's sabotaged all of the good work, the somewhat good work of the Obama administration in terms of normalizing relations with Cuba. He's completely, uh, I think, alienated Mexico as a consequence of his racist treatment of the people of Mexico. And protectionism regarding uh, trade with the rest of the region. Yeah, if you listen to Donald Trump, you think the reason there are poor people in America is because Mexico took all of the jobs and all of the money from the United States. He wanted to build a big wall, a beautiful wall, make Mexico pay for it. All of that isn't going to happen. What it did do is create a lot of hatred in the United States towards Mexicans. Uh, he, he accused a Mexican individual as an immigrant for murdering somebody. That individual, by the way, was just acquitted at trial. Uh, the the uh, policy of the Trump administration is far right wing, far right wing towards Latin America. He has no respect for Latin America. He wants Latin America to be America's backyard only. That's in the good old times, quote unquote. Yeah, he wants the worst of the good old times. Talking about Donald Trump, uh, you were mentioning that his presidency has, uh, has made a, a, a very peculiar change regarding the perception of the U.S. all over the world. Tell us about that. Uh, Donald Trump is doing great damage to the U.S. empire. For that, perhaps the world will ultimately thank Donald Trump, but it's, uh, it's an unintended consequence of his conduct. Here is a man who stands up at the U.N. General Assembly and says about a, another member state, Democratic People's Republic of Korea or North Korea, we're prepared to totally annihilate you, to totally destroy you, and calls the head of state Little Rocket Man. He says we're going to have fire and fury, a war like one that has never been seen before. Uh, he's uh, ridiculing all of the U.S. allies. He's, as you mentioned in the beginning, sending out racist, vile, racist, anti-Muslim tweets. And when Theresa May, the principal ally of the United States in Britain, says, no, don't do that. You are wrong. You are wrong to do that. Donald Trump tweets against her. He's such a narcissist. He's, he's so all about Donald Trump that as a consequence, the rest of the world now thinks the United States government, the largest economy in the world, the largest military in the world, the most powerful country in the world, has a president who is a complete laughing stock. And of course, that can't but help diminish America's stature in world politics. He's uh, simplifying uh, the good and bad people in the Middle East. Uh, good guys, Israel, uh, Saudi Arabia, the, the blue man, uh, Iran and Syria, is that right? Good guys are called Christians, end of story. Bad guys are called Muslims. So when you're talking about the Middle East, a predominantly Muslim uh, part of the world, 
uh, he's basically targeting the entire region. You know what? That plays into the narrative of ISIS. ISIS says Muslims are at war with the West, and the West is at war with Muslims. And Donald Trump sort of is the spokesperson for exactly that narrative. Uh, and so as a consequence, Donald Trump is helping ISIS recruit, no doubt, because Donald Trump, president of the United States, uh, is carrying out this kind of apparent war against Muslims. There's looks like an obsession trying to erase the legacy of uh, President Barack Obama. We're talking about, for example, uh, the Cuba uh, reinstallation of uh, relations. We're talking about uh, Iran and the, and the nuclear um, deal. I'm talking about Obamacare is, is, and has been obsessed even with their birth certificate. What is wrong? Is that also a, a, a signal of racism because of uh, President Obama being an American, an African American? Oh, absolutely. The birther movement, which Donald Trump was a voice of, is a racist movement. I mean, even after it was clearly proved, not that any other president has had to prove that they were Americans. I mean, it's the first time a black man is elected and he has to spend a couple of years proving that he's actually an American and eligible to be president. That was a racist movement. But it was not only Cuba that uh, Trump trashed, uh, the, the Obama's plan, and the Comprehensive Plan of Action, also known as the Iran nuclear arms deal. Uh, also trashed was the Paris Climate Treaty. So the United States, the whole world recognizes that the, uh, our existence as a species is at stake. We're at the precipice. And the United States, the big power of the world, was, along with China, uh, partnering as the anchor for this global movement to reduce carbon emissions. Donald Trump says, no, nah, we, we want to get rid of uh, that because guess what? Climate uh, change is really a Chinese hoax. I mean, this is the president of the United States? Really? You were mentioning North Korea. Are we closer to a war? Well, you know, the DPRK uh, during the past year has really becoming, a, has had so many advances with its technology, missile technology, and uh, nuclear weapons technology, that it is perhaps at the final stage of becoming a full-fledged nuclear power. That is a deterrent for the United States. Uh, when the United States had Libya get rid of its weapons of mass destruction, then it invaded Libya and killed the leader, lynched him in the streets. Uh, when, the United, when Iraq gave up its weapons of mass destruction, the U.S. went in and invaded Iraq, and the president of the country was hung by his neck and, and killed. Uh, North Korea is not going down that road. So it's a very high stakes game. Most people who have a brain in the Pentagon or in Washington would say a war with North Korea is absolute madness. The U.S. didn't win the war against North Korea in 1950 to 53. It succeeded in killing four million Koreans, but the U.S. was ultimately driven down below the 38th parallel. Uh, that's where their, their forces stopped. That's where they still occupy. So I think there's a lot of uh, reasons why there might not be a war. Why would there be a war? There are, there's a section of the American political establishment, we don't know if Donald Trump is amongst them, who believe that war with North Korea is inevitable and it's better to get it over with sooner than later because North Korea will only get stronger. And as Lindsey Graham, the senator who's a big buddy of Donald Trump and a golfing partner said, and by the way, the war will be over there. The bleeding will be done by Koreans and Japanese and Chinese. We won't, it won't be us. So there is a lobby for war, but I hope, I think, there will be saner brains in Washington who will say, that's madness. In the recent days, the New York Times was publishing an article saying that um, John Kelly, the chief of staff of the White House, was planning the replacement of Rex Tillerson as uh, the State Department uh, representative and possibly Mike Pompeo. Pompeo. Um, the director of the CIA could replace him. Uh, officially, the word of Donald Trump was, Rex is here, Rex is here. Uh, they're thinking that it could be a replacement at the end of the year, eventually early next year. What is being the principle about that sort of dispute of uh, Tillerson and Donald Trump? Because also, uh, it was a word that, that Tillerson was calling Trump a moron. Could be, you know, Rex Tillerson didn't completely deny that he called Donald Trump a moron, and Donald Trump, as a narcissist, which is what he is, that would be the worst thing. But I think it's because Rex Tillerson is not an ideologue. He's not a right-wing ideologue. He's a conservative capitalist. He was the CEO of ExxonMobil. 
But, you know, he wanted to negotiate with the DPRK, with North Korea. His president cut him off at the knees, chopped him off at the knees, and said, Rex, ah, you're wasting your time. Uh, we'll take care of it. You can't talk to little rocket man. I mean, here's the president of the United States humiliating the Secretary of State. Obviously, Tillerson can't be that happy about that. But if, if Pompeo goes from the CIA to State Department and Tom Cotton, who is a 39-year-old or 40-year-old Republican freshman, uh, becomes the head of the CIA, Tom Cotton was the leader of the 47 senators who sent a letter to the Islamic Republic of Iran in 2015 saying, don't bother signing a joint comprehensive plan of action agreement with the United States because when Obama's gone, we'll still be here and we'll make sure that we're going to impose sanctions and, and, and tear that agreement up. So intolerance. So intolerance, but this would be a sharp shift, I think, within the Trump administration against Iran. So Pompeo is uh, fiercely against Iran. Mattis, uh, Kelly himself, uh, all of these people are significantly against Iran. But Tom Cotton, his, the only reason somebody would like Tom Cotton, who has no experience and he's a complete, I don't know, buffoon, the only reason Donald Trump would make him the head of the CIA would be because he shares his anti-Iran uh, ferocious uh, focus. So finally, Brian, what do you think that we have to be paying attention in the rest of uh, Trump's presidency? Uh, I think the, the redistribution of wealth in America, if Trump's tax plan goes forward, it's going to be terrible for working class and poor people in the United States. He's uh, lifting all of the environmental protections that stop pollution. A lot of people die from pollution. It's not just eventual climate change. People are dying right now because of environmental things. There is a, a serious danger of war, I think, of confrontation because Trump is so unpredictably reckless. Uh, maybe he will be restrained. And finally, will Trump even make it? Will he make four years? Uh, will the indictments uh, finally bring down Trump? A big part of the American political establishment recognizes that Donald Trump is in fact a disaster, not just for people, but for their system and for their empire. And so there's a lot of them who want to bring him down. Uh, including from the elites within um, uh, the United States establishment. Brian Baker, thanks very much for joining My us. My pleasure. Thank you.